Hi everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady, coming to you from a very, very noisy suburban landscape on a sunny Sunday in Central North Carolina, Zone 7. Hopefully my fancy new microphone is working. Before I get too far along, I'm going to stop and I'm going to check it <laughs> because I am really good at having technical difficulties. All right, the good news is I think my microphone is working and hopefully when I get to different parts of the garden, you won't have as much background noise, but I've got a neighbor getting trees chopped down. Actually, they're murdering their trees, which is not something that you should do. It's totally unnecessary. They should be doing proper pruning, but they're not. Um, you know, they don't ask me, so <laughs> I just stay away. Um, anyhow, it's been a really wonderful frost-free week since I last checked in with you and a lot of stuff has started to bloom. So I am excited to take you around the garden and give you updates on everything from camellias and red buds to forsythia and poppies. So let's get on it and take a stroll today. So I know I've showed you October Affair before, but this has been budded for what feels like forever and the flowers are finally starting to open and see it's just such a beautiful flower and over here the royal velvet has expanded a lot now i don't see any fully open yet but it's really just a matter of hours now when this will really start to burst into bloom an oddity here is distillium that's starting to flower. I love using this uh, as filler and cut flower arrangements and you can see I have tons of hellebore flowers to gather for floating arrangements. And we have a cooler forecast coming up. Nights in the actually near freezing. I'm debating on whether I'm gonna need to protect plants or not but that's good news for my floating arrangements because these hellebores melt when we have temperatures in the upper 60s and 70s. So kind of glad to see more spring-like temperatures arriving for the longevity of those. And one of my favorite camellias is Jack's. If you follow us over on No Rules Gardening, uh, that's the combined channel that Jim Putnam and I have been working on of HortTube. We are currently doing a sweet 16 of camellias, like March Madness, you know? And Jax is in the running. And um, I just wanted to show you my Jax, so you, if you watch that video, you'll get some context as to why I think not only is it a beautiful flower, but a really spectacular plant. It's dense and uh, very pyramidal. I've never done any pruning on this tree. And um, just an overall spectacular habit. So an update on my late poppy sowing. I don't see any poppies germinating in here, but I do see the green seeds that I tossed down. So I think I did radishes and that's what all of this is. So I really think my advice stands, you need to plan to sow your poppies, larkspur, nigella, bachelor buttons at Black Friday. And mark your calendar now so you do it correctly this November. Now looking over here, this was one of the last beds that I direct sowed in January. And this is a difficult bed because it's so full of perennials that the perennials are always going to outcompete the seeded annuals. But I see things like uh, mustard here and... There's, of course, weeds everywhere. <laughs> Videos of just me weeding. Um, but other things that are germinating that are good. I know I've seen, here we go. I've seen uh, crimson clover, which I sowed on purpose. You see larger mustards coming up. It'll be interesting to see how this bed really develops with all that phlox and there's Asiatic lilies and actually it's totally infested with elephant ears. Um, so yeah, annual seeds have a difficult time competing, 
But this area over here, this is all larkspur. So this is going to be really pretty when it blooms. Now I did get my shed emptied this week, probably a bit prematurely. We have some cool temperatures coming like actually tonight. So I'm probably going to have to stash a lot of these tender succulents back in. But I know they've already benefited just from a few days out in the air, in the sun, actually getting some water. But, you know, 34 degrees is too cold for these plants. So beware. Don't, don't skip. We're not in summer yet. Now, I just posted an update on potatoes yesterday. So you can see that video. But you can see these Kaveen bags are doing really well. As are all of the other pots that... I have planted in various videos in the last couple of weeks. The seeds are just germinating like mad. This is all salad greens. So there's going to be a whole lot to harvest very soon. And I just wanted to show you this really pretty and super fragrant floating flower arrangement. This is a combo of Edgeworthia chrysantha, that's this flower, and then various hellebores, or I'm sorry, various camellias from throughout my garden. I've counted and I have 52 different varieties of camellia <laughs> and I keep buying more. So yeah, it's an addiction. So you'll notice that I have got garlic planted on the edges of all my beds. And this is very intentional and I know I've explained it, but I'm gonna reiterate it and let you know that I have got a webinar coming up in early April through the NC Botanical Garden called Keep the Animals Out. It's a two hour session and I'm gonna cover all of my strategies for animal brows. It's a very practical class. 100% of the proceeds go to the Botanical Garden and their plant conservation efforts. So I'd highly recommend that you go ahead and register for that class. Um, garlic is a great option because the bulbs keep the voles out. In this bed, I've employed that strategy and I've, I have tulips that are coming up. Also, another plant they don't like to eat is mustard. That's why I grow so much mustard. And I'm just gonna include a whole bunch of really great tips. So if you deal with animals like deer and rabbits and squirrels and groundhogs and chipmunks and really so much more, that is the webinar for you to sign up for. So all of the greens that I planted last fall are really starting to grow rapidly now. You can see how they look like an ornamental grass just starting to grow out of dormancy in this clump fashion. So I have a bunch of different things. You can see the difference between here's wheat. It's a little bit smaller in contrast to the barley, which has uh, a slightly taller and lighter green habit. And all of these together are gonna just look so incredible, especially with the backdrop of poppies and larkspur. All that will be filling in in the next probably four weeks and really blooming by the end of April. The Edgeworthia continue to be the stars of this spring and considering last year in Raleigh I don't think anybody got any Edgeworthias to flower because we had an early freeze and they weren't hardened off so most of the flowers actually fell off this year they're fully compensating and <laughs> it's so glorious and it's really great because the witch hazel just keeps on going I'm still able to use that for cut flower arrangements and now the real peaches, the eating peaches, are starting to bloom. It's difficult to see because it's so sunny, but you can see their buds right there. The Prunus mumes are just about finished. So we really are moving from that winter, late winter season into actual spring. Speaking of eating peaches, this is a dwarf variety that I've been trialing for the past year and I haven't gotten word whether they're going to release this or not, but I hope they do because it's done really well for me. I see I have it in a 100 gallon root pouch because I received this as a small bare root whip. This is a variety called Red Baron 
and it's really beautiful and I'm hoping to actually get some peaches this year uh, I have to do some research I've actually never grown peaches for eating and I think you actually have to remove some of the flowers and or maybe you let them those all get pollinated and then you start removing the fruit when they're small that way you get larger peaches to set I'm not a I'm not a stone fruit grower at all so I'll I'll have to do some some research and uh, learn actually how to grow peaches successfully. I know I showed you Mount Aso last week. Look at how much bigger the catkins have gotten. They're absolutely covered in pollen. It's just the coolest plant. Oh my goodness. And then I can't not take you back here. <laughs> this Edgeworthia is the most magnificent thing. Again, it's in the stupidest place. If you haven't been watching my videos, like this is my happiest Edgeworthia. It rooted in a pot. Um, I'm not gonna move it, but it does show you that Edgeworthia can grow, what, six inches off of a foundation landscape and thrive. It's not what I would recommend, but you know, compared to all my other plants, this is hands down the happiest, healthiest, obviously most floriferous plant. And, oh gosh, it's just the best smell. It's this very like honey forward fragrance. Oh, I wish that smell of vision existed. And more Edgeworthia here in the edge of the woodland. The camellias as well. This is one called Happy. This is a Higo variety, which was selected for these single row of petals and then these massive stamens. All of the hydrangeas are breaking dormancy. Of course, things like daffodils and trilliums are really starting to come up. And the camellias and hellebores just can't be beaten at this time of year. You see there's a variety hasn't opened yet. And then lots of these beautiful little double hellebores. They're so elegant. And then that crimson candles back here. It's just really, if you live in zone seven to nine, your life is not complete if you don't have crimson candles. This is another one that's included in our sweet 16 on no rules gardening, but it is just the, one of the most terrific camellias that's ever been introduced. The blueberries are starting to break dormancy and go into flower. And I, you know, this is always the time of year. My former boss, when I first moved to North Carolina, pardon my French, but this is what she used to always say, like, spring is a fickle bitch. And it's true because just when you feel confident, all of a sudden we get cold again. And we're early enough in March where everything should be able to recover. But you know, you just wanna hold your breath and keep your fingers crossed that days like this where everything starts to grow, aren't going to be followed by nights in the 20s where all of that new growth might get nipped. Another example of that are these containers, which you know, are in a microclimate. If I had a zone eight pocket on my property, it's here. You know, all this heat that's absorbed from the concrete and the side of the house, these containers are so far advanced compared to other parts of the garden. So this is just a mix of violas and barley. You can totally see now why I love using these winter grains um, as essentially spring active uh, ornamental grasses. That's going to ultimately go to flower and it's going to look super cool. Same thing here. These are foodscape containers. I do webinars teaching this method as well for year round growing in containers, cultivating both beauty and bounty. And, you know, in here we've got. Um, you know, of course, everything in here is edible because you can eat the violas, you can eat the Swiss chard, you can eat the parsley, you can eat that broccoli that's growing there. It's just a really practical thing to have literally right off the steps from your kitchen door. So I can run out and, you know, grab what I need when I'm making a salad. I think this container is doing well. That again, this is barley. This has a backdrop element. The living wall has really come in. The snapdragons have doubled in size just in the last week and the violas and parsley, everything is doing well in here. 
I'm going to give this a dose of fertilizer later this week when our night temperatures are warmer. And a few more containers worth noting. Here's my little stash of plants that I need to plant today. I'm going to do a show you how to foodscape video using all those broccolis and cauliflowers that I've purchased from garden centers. And I have a floating flower tub that I need to make a new arrangement for today, full of possibilities. And finally, this area that I planted a few weeks ago in a video, and I have been having to keep this watered. I just, you know, water for a few minutes with a hose to make sure that those poor primroses stay perky. It's been, uh, it's a bit brighter than I realized. I think that's because I used to have a lot of like overgrown shrubs in here and so I thought this was a bit shadier than it may actually be in reality. So hopefully these plants will survive. If not, I'll be transplanting some things out. Like last year I transplanted all those rhodias in here and it was shadier because I had, the, you know, other plants that have now been taken out. And so that's not the end of the world. I can always move them to another part of the garden if they get sunburned here. And that's just part of the reality of gardening and, you know, knowing that you're going to be making changes. I'm super stoked to see this blooming. This actually came in a collection um with tulips and other bulbs and all those tulips are growing well and you can see this bed has really filled out i have some weeding to do in here not a lot but i need to get it now while the weeds are small but if you remember the video where i was planting this i did a mix of greens right along this edge and now you can really see you know what that color and texture combination results in so i'll be able to start harvesting salads from here i can make salsa using all this cilantro and soon the bachelor buttons the poppies and the larkspur will be blooming right along with these big clumps of barley so the forsythia is blooming now that's really a great sign of spring and i have had uh, a lot of questions about my fall experiment where I just sowed or threw poppy seeds into this border without prepping the soil at all. And the only place that I'm seeing good germination is right in here. And you see that these are all poppies germinating. In part, that's because, and you can't really tell on this video, but I have these neighbor dogs who are super sweet but they like to run they run through this bed and this this right here is a path so um it's a dog path uh if there were seeds that were going to germinate there they may have gotten trampled but as i'm saying that i'm seeing some new stuff germinate and that's a poppy there so you know the real key with poppies you just gotta sow them on open soil so they have light to germinate. And whether you prep the soil well or not, they should in theory grow for you. Now I don't know whether they will grow to full fruition. And actually here, I wanna give you a shot of the dogs. There's, there's um, Benjamin and Oreo. They like, to, they like to run through this border. And we let them because they, they, they like to have little dog races. And it's a shrub border and so you know it's having an area for your for pets and, and neighborhood pets to be able to enjoy is important well hopefully you watched my potato video that i just posted you'll recognize this bed this is the wave it's full of barley poppies and larkspur though the poppies have not germinated to what i to the degree i was hoping it's still gonna be pretty because there's a lot of larkspur. So that's that's here, that's the larkspur. But I, again, I, I am disappointed. But uh, I've been seeing a lot of rabbits. Like, oh my God, it's rabbit season, you guys. So um, I got this whole edge along here and then all the way around the backside. 
planted with potatoes as a means of discouraging those bunnies. Potatoes are poisonous foliage and they're really good for rabbits because the rabbits smell that and they know instinctively that it's poisonous and then they just run to someone else's yard and that's really what it's all about. So to add to the general loudness of this spring Sunday, my husband has also pulled out his equipment. So he is edging and mowing and generally playing with small engines. People always ask, how do we get such a crisp edge on our beds? And it's from this great machine, the Still Edge Definer. David does it about three or four times a year. It takes a half an hour to do all of the bed edges in the yard. And that is exactly how we maintain these bed edges so nicely. So it is cherry season here in North Carolina. If you drive around anywhere, you see cherries blooming absolutely everywhere. And sadly, the Bradford pears and their offspring, the calorie pears, are all also starting to flower. So it's, everything's going to start to smell like fish. Yuck. But these cherries are wonderful. This is the Prunus subhertilla variety, autumn, or autumnalis variety rosia. So this is one that actually blooms in the fall and then again in the spring. And it's just one of those trees that I would never want to garden without. It's so beautiful. Back to where I started this video with my sound check. You see the bees certainly enjoy these cherry blossoms. This is a Prunus incisa variety. It's great because it's much shorter. You know, so if you have a space where you don't really want a tall tree, check out Prunus incisa. I think this might be Kojonomai, but honestly, it's been 10 years and I lost the label. Oh, I forgot to look up when I walked through here earlier. So here is the Chinese redbud, Cirrus canadensis. This is Dawn Egoff. You see it's full of buds. The entire plant flowers, the buds are all along the stems even. So it's very different than the native redbud, which also blooms much later. This is nice kind of early, early flowering. Right along with that is the star magnolia. And that is also a sign of spring and potential frost. <laughs> so it's important to be realistic. You know, here in the Southeast, it's, it's really common that things start to bloom and then we get cold again. And don't let that discourage you. It's pretty normal. If we get to enjoy a season that we don't experience that, don't take it for granted. And because I grew up in Michigan, I have an affinity for lilacs, even though lilacs are notoriously not long lived in the Southeast. And often you don't really find the this good smelling varieties of lilacs. I'm happy to share this variety, but you can see, so this branch is alive and then all of this is dead. So every year I have a massive amount to cut back off of this. So it's not necessarily the greatest plant to include, but if you're desperate for that fragrance, this is Syringa hyacinthiflora Excel. So if you just Google Excel lilac, you should be able to find, maybe you should find some sources. It's not super common, but it is a wonderful plant. You could see like this, this branch that's alive does have flower buds coming and it smells like the lilacs of the north. So if you're a transplant from zone five like me and you long for that scent that really was the sign of spring up, up in the north, um, this, this is a lilac that will kind of bring that back to you. Well, I want to encourage all of you to go over to No Rules Gardening, the YouTube channel, watch our new video. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe to that. Um, go follow us on Instagram so you can participate in the Sweet 16 Camellia vote. It's going to be so much fun. And don't forget Jax. This is a really amazing Camellia. 
Uh, really, really best for zones seven through nine, but in the Camellia Sweet 16, we did include zone six hardy varieties for those of you who want to uh, zone bend and grow some camellias outside of their normal range. And I hope you've enjoyed this tour and I look forward to catching up with you next week. Thanks so much for watching everybody. Happy spring.